By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back at the Often Troll Cup. Yeah, we are back. And today I'm going to show you the finals of this event. And I'm really stoked because, I mean, it's going to be awesome. We have a mega control player playing the deck today. His name is Ghost. And he's taking on Rasmus. And he's playing an aggro deck, right? Green with a little bit of black, stompy aggro. You know, he wants the game to be really short. He's in it to win it as fast as possible. While his opponent, Ghost, is the ultimate control player. If you look at his version of the deck... It's only control. Now, before I start with the deck decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to go to the games first, check the deck deck later. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps or chapters, as they are called these days. Click on the chapter MTG Games, and it'll take you straight to the games. And in the description below, you can also find more information about the rule set. And also, maybe if you want to join the Upton Troll Cup next year, you can find information about how to contact the organizers. The Instagram uh, account is there, but also a link to their Facebook page. So you can find all that information in the description below. And here I'm going to continue with the deck deck. And I'm actually going to start with the deck by Coase. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Coase. Now, Coase... He is well known as a very good the deck player. And I mean, look at this. This is uber control, isn't it? I mean, he's not even playing with any creatures. No Sarah Angels, no Mahamoti Jins. We saw those versions earlier in the game, but also no Fireball. Remember um, the semifinals, we saw Fireball being quite decisive for that the deck player. We're not seeing it in here. Yes, it is in the sideboard, but it's not in the main board. So his strategy is like uber control, right? He's playing three jam day tomes. A lot of versions of the deck nowadays only play two, but he's playing three. He really wants that. He wants to, from a stable board position, board presence, he wants to draw cards on the end step of his opponent with the jam day tome. But of course, he wants to keep mana up to counter everything away. He's got sword supplies, he's got disenchants, he's also playing with two power sinks, he's playing with the mana drain. And then, of course, kind of use his power to kind of get card advantage, right? A well timed ancestral recall, a brain geyser for a lot of cards, of course, your jam day tomes for a lot of cards. And then he's playing with the abyss to get rid of, uh, of the creatures of the opponent. You know, it's, it, it's all there. And the big question is, how does he want to win? Well, simple. He wants to win with his four Mistress Factories from an uber control position. That's what he wants to do. Now, what's more interesting here is looking at the sideboard. Because I think with this main board, it's going to be really difficult for Ghost in Game 1. And the reason I'm saying that is because his main strategy to get rid of the creatures besides Swords to Plowshares or the Abyss right? He's playing with two The Abyss, and The Abyss is an enchant world, and during your upkeep, you have to sacrifice a creature, right? A non-artifact creature. So, but The Abyss, it kind of works too slow for these, you know, uber creature strategies that Rasmus is playing. Like, he's got so many creatures, sacking one isn't a big problem. Also, Swords to Plowshares, yes, it's annoying, but basically you're trading one card for one card. So one creature, four swords. He's only got four swords. He's probably going to uh, play too fast, so that, you know, Coast cannot counter it away. So that's going to be tough for him. I think after the first game, when he can start sideboarding, he's got some more chances. You know, he can board in an extra maze. He can board in uh, the Ivory Towers to gain life from all the card advantage. He can board in that Fireball, because Fireball is not just good for the life total against Rasmus. It's also great just to kill like three or four creatures if you've got enough mana. Remember, Rasmus's creatures, they're all small, green, weenie creatures. So they're kind of easy to destroy with the Fireball if you have enough mana. But this is really going to be a game where we see two strategies meet each other. We've got Coast, Uber Control. If the game takes longer, it's good for him. And then we've got Rasmus. The shorter the game, the better it usually is for him. Talking about that, let's take a look at the deck of Rasmus. And here we see the deck of Rasmus. So this is really, it's so cool, you know. So this is an underpowered deck, people. I'm just going to say it again. No Moxen, no Blue Power, or the cheat cards, as I like to call them. They're not in here, you know. This is pure green muscle with a little bit of help from Black, right? Those terrors, they've been brilliant for him throughout the tournament. In this match, though, the terrors are not going to save him because the only creatures that Coase is playing with, remember, are the Mistress Factories, and they cannot be targeted by the terror. But the good news here for Rasmus is, He's got so many answers for those factories. I mean, he's got three ice storms. He's got four crumbles. He's got four scavenger folk. So he's got more than enough to deal with those um, with those mistress factories. And, you know, what makes this deck so good, actually, is the fact that he's playing with a lot of creatures. If we count the creatures, he's got four, eight, 12, 15, 
19, oh man, I lost count here. But anyway, 20 plus creatures, just a lot of creatures. Also playing with Mishra's factories, of course. So what he can do is he can put on pressure on whoever the opponent is, in this case, Coast, starting at turn one, playing creatures, playing more creatures, turning them sideways, dealing damage from turn one. If he's on the play, if he, you know, it, it, it's just really good for Rasmus. You know, he can put a lot of pressure on. I really like the fact that this deck has three Pendle Havens in it because with this deck, you always want to have a Pendle Haven. I mean, you've got so many 1-1s. One you've got your Scripps Prize. You've got your Lunar Elves. You've got your Scavenger Folks. You've got your Elves of Deep Shadow. All those creatures get so much better if they're two threes instead of one ones. And by playing with three Pendle Havens, you kind of have that guarantee. I also really like the double Mace of If in this deck because it means if your opponent has, you know, a good blocker like a Serenda Pafrit, for example, you know, it's only three. A lot of people played it early in the game. It doesn't matter. You can keep attacking because whatever bad block happens, you use your Mace, you take that creature out of combat so it doesn't die. And you get to attack another turn again and again and again and again and again. It's pressure, 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 pressure. I think that before sideboarding, call me crazy, I think that Rasmus is a favorite. And I'm saying that if, if I would see this matchup in the Swiss rounds, I would always say that Kos is the favorite. I'm going to be honest with you. But the fact that Rasmus made it all the way to the finals with this list and he's playing against a blue-white, which is the deck, is a, mainly a blue-white control deck, Rasmus has seen so many of these control decks throughout the tournament and he's in the final. So apparently he beat them all. So if he's gone this far, I think that before sideboarding, because Kosa's list is so controlling, that before sideboarding, I think Rasmus is a slight favorite. A slight favorite. I think if he can win that game one, then we have an interesting finals. If he's gonna, if he's gonna lose game one, I, I I think after sideboarding, you know, I think I think Coase really has the, the upper hand. But if he can win that first game, we got a finals. Anyway, what I think actually isn't important at all. I want to congratulate Coase and Rasmus for reaching the finals. I want to thank Gron for organizing such a kick-ass tournament. I want to thank Dion for all the recordings that you've made. You guys are all awesome. Now let's go to the finals. Game number one of the finals is about to begin. This is so thrilling. Both players taking a mulligan here, starting with six in hand. We've got Erasmus sitting on the left with the purple sleeves. He's playing green, black aggro. He's taking on the deck with the white sleeves. And we see Erasmus is on the play, starting with the bayou, playing an Alanara Elves and passing the turn. This is exciting. We see a strip mine there in hand. I can see a... Uh, Swords to Plowshares as well there in the hand of Ko, starting here with a Mox Sapphire, a Tundra, and a Quick Swords here on the Lanawar Elves. That makes sense. It's kind of the, the start you want to have when you're the deck player. You want to have that Swords to kind of stop the tempo play of Rasmus. Rasmus here playing a uh, Pendlehaven, tapping both for an Argovian Pixies, a 2-1 creature from the Antiquities expansion. Cannot be blocked by artifacts and damage dealt by artifacts is reduced to zero. The interesting thing about this card is that it's not like it has protection from artifacts. That's slightly different. For example, I can tap... Ooh, here we see a Mind Twist for two. I want to say, for example, I can tap the Argovian Pixies with an Icy Manipulator. But here we see a Mind Twist for two. So this is really bad news for Rasmus. And it's looking quite good here for the deck player. So Rasmus gets to keep just one card. Gonna lose an Ice Storm and an Ice Storm. Ooh, that is painful. Remember, if he still would have had that Lanawar Elf from turn one, he could have played an Ice Storm instead of the Argovian Pixies. That would have been a big difference. We just see here the past turn. A lot of lands now in hand, though, for the deck player. So that kind of offers a possibility here for Rasmus. The deck player really wants to find a Gem Day Tome here to start using all that mana and turn those mana into cards. But now he's just taking damage from the Pixies. He's on 16. I believe he's got a Disenchant in hand there and two lands. One of them being a City of Brass and another one a Duel. There he's drawing. Oh, a Black Lotus. That is really bad for Kos here. Doesn't need more mana. There's another attack. Look at the Argovian Pixies go. It's already dealt eight points of damage. Counterspell's not going to help him. Wow. Is this Pixies going to like... Cut Kose's life in half. Yes, it is. 10 life for Kose. He's really under pressure. And I thought after the swords and, and the twist, he was on top. But he just can't seem to find anything apart from lands and mana sources. Here, there's a Felwer Stone. You know, and this can happen sometimes. 
You have a lot of mana sources. Ideally, you find, of course, your gem day tome and you, you turn that mana advantage into cards, but he's not finding it. A Mox Ruby, even more mana. Wow, and look at this by Rasmus. He's on four. He's going to cast a creature. I'm expecting a counter spell here. Because why not? Yeah, there's the counter spell. I mean, Kos is on four. He had to counter that uh, scavenger folk. There we see Rasmus playing out another Pendlehaven. He's probably doing that because of this card, Balance. Because now if Kos has to balance, at least he's going to lose a lot of cards. There we see the balance by Kos. Taking care of the Pixies, but wow. And how many lands do these players have? We see two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on the side of Rasmus. And seven lands on the side of uh, Kos. So there we see Rasmus having to part with one of the lands, putting the uh, Maze of If in the graveyard. Does he have another creature? Demonic Tutor! I mean, look up a Hurricane. Hurricane for four. It's over. I wonder what he's going to do here. I hope he's going to take the Hurricane. Yes, it's a risk, but of course, we know that the card in hand of Kos is just a disenchant. But remember, Rasmus, of course, doesn't know that. Magic would be a lot easier if you, of course, know what kind of cards your opponent has. I'm so curious to see what he looked up. He can win it right here on the spot with the Hurricane. It is a risk, though, because if Kos, of course, has a counter spell, he's going to build it back up again. But I think it's worth the risk. And it's a Hurricane for four, winning game one with a record. This went so fast. This went so incredibly fast. And I mean, Kos, really, if I look back at the start, Sword Supply of Share, Mind Twist, I thought you had it in the back, but then only lands, Black Lotuses, Counter Spells, Mox Rubies. You couldn't find anything to really help you until it was too late. The balance came way too late. You were already down on four. And then... Demonic Tutor into Hurricane. You know, Rasmus took the risk. It was a good risk with only one card in hand on the side of Coast. So a victory here for Rasmus in game one. And now both players are going to dive into their sideboards. And we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So full pressure here on Coast. After losing that first game, he's got to win this to stay here in the finals. If he loses this game, it's all over. And Rasmus will win the title here of the Often Troll Cup number four. Starting here with a Pendlehaven into a Lana Rails passing the turn. And we saw Kos playing an Ivory Tower on turn one from the sideboard. And look at this. Kos is not playing out anything, just passing the turn. Fully trusting on his Ivory Tower here to keep him alive. Ivory Tower, of course, a great card because it's going to give him life. But, I mean, if Rasmus can put on enough pressure, look at what he's doing. A Lana Rails, Elf, Scavenger Folk, and an Elves of the Deep Shadow. This is pressure. I mean, I don't think he's going to survive on the ivory tower alone i mean he needs mana that's what he needs can he find some look at his hand though i don't think there's any mana in there i see sorts of plowshares mana drain disenchant is that maybe an ancestral recall that one blue card that's hard to see that could be a reason for him to keep it you know ancestral recall in hand ivory tower in hand and you're probably going to trust it you're going to draw into some lands but if that doesn't happen Gonna attack now. Of course, Rasmus can use the Scavenger Folk here to destroy the Ivory Tower. It's gonna tap two. Gonna play Chaos Orb instead. I'm a little bit surprised. If I would have played the Chaos Orb, I probably would have kept the Lanawar Elves untapped, would have attacked here with the other three creatures, and then it could have activated the Chaos Orb with the Lanawar Elf. Flip probably on his land because he's a mana pro. Uh, he has mana issues here. That's what I'm trying to say. And now Ghost still hasn't found land. He's got a discard, discarding a counter spell. Oh, it's looking so bad for Ghost and so good for Rasmus. Remember, he's already one game up. I mean, just I, I would now use Scavenger Folk on the tower, Ivory Tower, maybe Chaos Sorb here on the on the land. Okay, Ice Storm on the land. That's really good. Activating here the Scavenger Folk and attacking for one, putting Ghost on 22. But this is a really good turn for Rasmus. Look on the board. Of course, or actually lack thereof. There's nothing. He did find a Tundra of, at the top of his library. Um, so that's good news for him. Now he can cast perhaps an Ancestral Recall if it's there. Or else he can cast the Swords to Plowshares. And of course we see Rasmus here activating his Chaos Orb. I'm expecting a response here. Okay, there's a Swords. So I guess he doesn't have an Ancestral Recall in hand. Or else he would have activated that. Now this is important. Let's put it in slow-mo here. Is he going to hit the Tundra? Here we go. Oh, he's going to miss. He misses it. Is it? Oh my lord! Rasmus, my man! The finals! Missing it here. 
and I mean, it, it's 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 a threat, but Coase is hanging on a threat at least. And I feel that if that Tundra would have been destroyed here, I mean, he's still in trouble though. There is a maze, I'm expecting exactly animating here. He's gonna attack for four, he can use the Pendlehaven. And he can deal five points of damage. In response, we're probably gonna see exactly a sword here. So he's just gonna take three points. He's gonna drop to 16. I mean, Ghost is still in trouble, don't get me wrong, but if he can find, there's a land. I mean, this could turn quickly. Passing again, he's got another Swords in hand. He's got Counter Magic up now. And he's on 16. Let's see what Rasmus can do. Can he put some more pressure on? Animating, attacking here. There's the Disenchant though. Rasmus tapping too. There's an Argovian Pixies in the pass. There's a Black Lotus. That Black Lotus is looking really good right now. In game one, when he drew the Black Lotus, it was horrible, but now... Oh, it's actually a Mind Twist. For some reason, I thought it was a Black Lotus. Or maybe he has a Black Lotus and a Mind Twist in hand. It looks like he's got both. That is brutal. Is he going to use that now? Yeah, yeah. He's going to use it there to take care of the hand of Rasmus. Oh, man, and this game is turning around very, very quickly. Look at that. Losing a Giant Grove. That Giant Grove would have been so good. It would have been so good. Oh man, okay, there's a strip mine, that's good. Keep stripping. In response to swords here. What is he gonna swords on? That's a big question. Is he gonna swords on? No, he's not doing it though. He is gonna swords. Okay, for a moment there I thought he wasn't swordsing. So playing a swords on the Argovian picks, he's taking two damage of course because a lot of where else gets pumped by the Pendlehaven. So 14 for Kos, 22 for Rasmus. There's that Ancestral Recall we saw. Wow, look at that. Finding lands, finding a time walk. He can use that next turn, get some tempo advantage. Gonna play out a land, passing the turn. At least Rasmus has one more attack in here. Could deal two more points of damage. I wonder what he's got in hand. Perhaps an Ice Storm. A spitting slug, yes, yeah, spitting slug in the final. It's so cool. Two four creature from the dark for two green and one. And let's see what Coast can do here. He's got that time walk, right? So how can he how can he use that? Also got a Felwer Stone to do some ramping, so he could play a land, play Felwer Stone, then play a time walk, untap with four. That's probably the way to go here, but we're just gonna wait and see. There's the underground sea. There's the Felwer Stone, and I'm expecting to see that time walk now. Exactly, there's the time walk. And Koz is really getting himself back into this game. Finding a Mox Emerald from the top. He's got that Brain Geyser that's looking so good. I mean, he also has the Demonic. He could go for... He doesn't have a White Source, though. I want to say he could go for... A balance, but he just doesn't have a white source. I wonder what he's gonna look up. Passing the turn, couldn't see it. Probably gonna. The problem here is that Mishra's factory can pump the factory. Then again, he's got the maze, so he can just attack here. And whatever creature is being blocked by the Mishra's factory can use the maze to take it out of combat. There's an abyss. Do you look up an abyss, of course? And he's taking all the damage. He doesn't want to run into the possible crumble. Because he wanna be able he wants to be able to play out the abyss. There's the abyss. And the abyss is slow, yes. But I mean with only two two creatures on the board and one card in hand for Rasmus, the abyss is gonna be so good here for Kos. There's the attack. Kos dropping to eight. And remember, Rasmus is gonna lose its spitting slug to the abyss next turn. There we see a City of Brass on the side of Coast. Coast still has that Brain Geyser in hand to refill his hand. But of course he wants to keep the mana drain open. He wants to go for full control. And if Rasmus attacks here with the factory, he's kind of signaling. He's not doing it though. He's, he would have kind of signaled to Coast that he has a crumble in hand. Coast being on 8, Rasmus still on 22, but lives don't really matter. It's all about control here. 
Although, of course, if Rasmus can find like a hurricane and he needs some more mana, he could win with the hurricane. But then again, I mean, I think at this moment in the game, Kos is going to keep his counter magic up. There's a Concordant Crossroads. This is a great card, but of course, Kos can counter. He is going to counter it away. This would have been a great answer to the Abyss. There's a Fireball and a pass. So he boarded Fireball in and Ivory Tower from the sideboard. There's a Power Sink in hand for Coast now as well. I think a Power Sink, Mana Drain, Brain Geyser, Fireball in hand for Coast. There's a Demonic Tutor. I mean, he could allow the Tutor just counter it, whatever he's going to do next. And I think this is a good decision by Coast, just saying, you know what, you can, you can go for it. I'm just going to keep enough mana open to counter. One of the options here for Rasmus is to think, okay, he probably has counter magic, so I'm going to look up a Mishra's Factory. Could be, could be a strategy here. Also because Mishra's Factory, of course, is ideal against the Abyss. But I mean, maybe he's going for the Hurricane, you know, and he's thinking, you know what? I'm just going to try to get up to nine mana. Then I'm going to cast my Hurricane and maybe I'm lucky. Going to cut the deck here. And we can't really, we cannot see the cards, unfortunately, of Rasmus. There's a Concordant Crossroads again, so that's probably what he looked up. He really wants to get rid of that Abyss. We're going to see another Counterspell. I mean, one of the things that you can do here as well, when your coast is think, you know what? I guess he's not thinking that because it looks like he's going to Power Sync. But you could think, you know what? I'm just going to counter away whatever creature you're going to play. But he is going to counter this uh, Concordant Crossroads. And then because of the Power Sync, Rasmus has to draw all the mana from his lands. But because Maze of If cannot generate mana, he can keep the Maze of If untapped. There's a Library of Alexandria here for Coast, by the way, which is quite good with that Brain Geyser in hand. Four cards in hand now for Rasmus. And I think he's kind of saving up, thinking what is the best way uh, to go with that Abyss. And you can now see Coast starting to pass. He's going to try to save up up to seven and draw cards with the Library of Alexandria. Here we see a Pendlehaven to replace the other Pendlehaven. It's looking pretty bad now. For Rasmus. And remember that start of this game too, I thought Coast is toast. But Coast survived. I think that missing flip was huge. And that Abyss is now really, really doing it here for Coast. So Coast having six in hand now, I believe. Rasmus playing Elves of Deep Shadow. I think he's now just gonna start to play out a lot of creatures. There's a script sprites. No response. There's a scavenger folk. No response. Okay. Oh, this is interesting now. Now he's going to draw into card number eight. Oh, man. Now Rasmus also has an active Loa to deal with. And remember that Mind Twist twisted away one of his city in the bottles. There is another Mishra's Factory. Now, the thing that Rasmus has, the only thing that he's got going for himself now in this game too, is the fact that Kos is low. Kos is on eight. So if he can just get some damage in. He's untapping everything again. I wonder what he's thinking about. He's got the fireball, of course. He does need the city to make red. So he would drop to seven, but it must be tempting. Problem here as well is that uh, Pendlehaven. So maybe he wants to wait until the Pendlehaven's tapped. It is risky though. I mean, he's on such a low life total. I believe he's got... I mean, he has enough mana to deal one damage to each of those creatures and keep mana open to counter. But then Rasmus will be able to save one of the creatures with the Pendlehaven. But then again, that same creature will, will die to the Abyss the following turn. It does mean then that I believe if he goes for that line, that Rasmus has, has a little opening and he can attack for two with the Factory. So it's understandable here that 
Coach really needs some time to think. So he is going to do something here using four mana. Play a Fireball. It looks like he's only going to target the Scavenger Folk. There's a Giant Grove though. Saving the Scavenger Folk. So he really wants to get rid of the Scavenger Folk. Interesting. Could that be because of the Mishra's Factories? Those are of course the main win con here in the deck of Kosa, especially now that he's using the Fireball to get rid of a creature. But this Giant Grove is saving the Scavenger Folk. And now he's also playing out a Mox Sapphire. So here we see Rasmus sacking the Elves of the Deep Shadow to the Abyss. What else can Rasmus do here? If he can just play another creature, that would be great for Rasmus. Look at him go attacking with two creatures. I'm a little... I guess I'm a little surprised here because I would have expected him to also attack with the Scavenger because you can always get it back. There's a Crumble upon activation on one of the uh, Mishra's Factories. Crumble is so good on Factory because your opponent doesn't even gain life. What is he going to do? Is he going to counter this away? That's the big question. He's got a Power Sink in hand, also has a Mana Drain in hand. Looks like he's going to do something. Okay, he also has a regular counterspell in hand, I guess. Playing a regular counterspell here. And then we see the usage of the Scavenger Folk. It's going to destroy the factory here on the side of Kos. I think there's not much that Kos can do against this. Of course, he can use the mana then to animate the other factory. So now he's got a 2-2. He can still block. And the scavenger folk is gone. At least I believe the scavenger folk is gone. So he's going to use the maze to save his own factory. Exactly. Scavenger folk is gone because he sacked the scavenger folk to destroy the factory. And now two damage is in. He's dropping to five. But of course, next turn, Rasmus is going to lose the script price. I think it's really important for Rasmus to try to get rid of that last factory because then he can keep attacking with his own factory. He's going to tap for, probably play exactly a Jam Day Tome. And Kos is so patient with that Brain Geyser. He really waits and waits and waits. He, he plays with so much control. There we see a tap for two. There's an Argovian Pixies. There is a Scavenger Folk. So Scavenger Folk, again the 1-1, one, one. this is really, really good. Argovian Pixie is good, but remember, next turn, there's a Mana Drain, though, on the Scavenger Folk. Next turn, Rasmus has to sack a creature again. That's a big problem. The Abyss is really, really controlling the game here for Kos. And, and we saw Rasmus playing both of his Concordant Crossroads, trying to get rid of the Abyss, but in both instances, they got countered away by Kos, and that's, uh, that's what's really winning the game here for him. The question, though, is how is Ko's going to get some damage in? It looks like he's now going to play the Brain Geyser. That, that's a Brain Geyser for 4, for 5, it seems. If he could go for 6, he then also has an active Loa. So this is a Brain Geyser for 5. So Brain Geyser, now it's a Brain Geyser for 6. A Sorcery, 2 blue and X. Draw X cards. So he's going to draw six. So he's going to go, go up to seven, then have an active Library of Alexandria. We see a lot of lands here. He's going to actually going to discard. Okay, now was he up to eight perhaps? Perhaps I was wrong. He's going to go through his graveyard. There's the animate and the attack. I'm expecting a disenchant here. It's going to draw a card first, then probably cast exactly, cast a disenchant. And there's a pass by Rasmus. I mean, when you're Rasmus, you kind of know it's very likely for Coast to have a disenchant. But I mean, your other option is do nothing. And I think that's not an option. So I really understand this attack. 
I mean, I guess when you're Rasmus, what's your strategy now? I mean, I, do, I think he doesn't have any Concorn Crossroads in his deck anymore. He could, of course, try to play a regrowth on the Concorn Crossroads. Try to get it on the board. Another strategy could be just to save up all those creatures. That's something that we saw him do earlier. So just save up a lot of smaller creatures, play them out all in the same time, trying to overwhelm your opponent. There's an attack for four, though. I mean, you can use the maze. The problem with the maze is, okay, we're first going to see a crumble. And then we see a maze on the other. So the problem, of course, with the maze of if is when you're being, getting attacked by two Mishra's factories, you can send one back, but you can use the factory that's being sent back to pump up the other factory, so you're only saving one damage. Now, in this case, it was ideal for Rasmus because he had that crumble. Remember, he's running four crumble, four scavenger folk, three ice storm. He's got a lot of answers to those Mishra's factories. And that, that could actually be a problem for Coast because eventually he wants to win with the factories. He does have a recall, of course, in his deck. So he's probably just going to play a big recall, get all the factories back. And that's the thing, of course, with these control decks. Once they have control, it can take quite long before they eventually win the game. There's a Chaos Orb, though. Now it can go faster. He can Chaos Orb the, um, the Mace of If and then start attacking for two each turn. So he is activating the Chaos Orb, targeting the Maze of If. Let's see if he can hit. We saw Rasmus miss earlier. That's a, that's a hit for sure. Taking care of the Maze and attacking for two and passing the turn. Counting his amount of cards, realizing the urgency now of his attacks. I mean, look at the life total of Rasmus. He's still pretty high. He's on 18. Is he going to make it? Has a strip mine now as well to potentially deal with another Maze of If on the side of Rasmus. But I don't really see any counter magic in hand there. I mean, he needs to be able to counter away a Crumble or an Ice Storm from the side of Rasmus. Attacking again for two. He's now on 16. There's a Power Sink. Okay, now he's got something to at least protect the, uh, the factory. There's a Pass Turn again. One of the things that Rasmus could start doing, I mean, look at Kos is now counting. He's got how many cards? Six in hand? Six or six in his library? So six more turns? Maybe less. It went a little bit too fast for me to count. There's a script sprite. So now he's going to play out a lot of creatures, trying to put them in front of, of the Mistress Factory of Kos. There's an Argovian Pixie. So two script sprites there, one, one, and an Argovian Pixies. A counter on the last Argovian Pixies. Interesting. And look at this. A Swords to Plowshares. But that's going to give him another life. Going to go up to 17. He's going to draw an extra card. Wow. Did he really just do that? Okay, he's going to play a recall. Okay, he's first going to play out of land, I guess. And then he's going to play a recall. He's going to go for his graveyard first, taking his time. But... He doesn't have a lot of turns anymore. He does have a lot of mana. This recall is great for him. He's got so much mana. Like, he can just take out whatever he needs from his, uh, from his yard. I guess I would get back... We could get this, the Fireball, of course. Fireball. I mean, Fireball is the way to go, isn't it? Like... Yeah, I think Fireball is really the way to go here. They're count oh, they're done. Okay, I guess they were counting the mana. That's uh, what they were doing. And they're done. I guess he could get back the Fireball and then finish the game with the Fireball. But, I mean, at, at a certain point in the game, I thought, Isco's going to run out of cards. And are we going to see Rasmus here winning with an aggro deck by decking his opponent? That would have been so funny. Uh, but it didn't happen. And what a swingy match, right? The start of this game, too, was really in favor of Rasmus. You know, Coast just starting with that one land hand and the ivory tower. That, that was all he had. And remember that missed flip. That changed everything, right? That changed everything. And, of course, then Coast started to find the lands from the top of his library. Anyway, we're going to give these players a moment to shuffle up. And we'll catch back up with them in the deciding game number three.
Game number three of the finals of the Upton Troll Cup. This is the big decider. Who's going to win the Upton Troll Cup 4? Coast on the right with the deck. Or Rasmus on the left playing black and green. Or I should say green and black aggro. Coast here taking a mulligan going down to six. And Rasmus is on the play. So it's looking pretty good for him. Let's see what he can do. Starting with the Lanora Elves in the pass. This simple classic opener has been so good for Rasmus the entire tournament. Ivory Tower though, for Kos. Remember, he did take a mulligan, so he's got five in hand now, meaning it only takes one life from the tower. There we see a Scavenger Folk being played by Rasmus and an Elves of the Deep Shadow, and of course that Mistress Factory. So this is a pretty good turn here for Rasmus. Next turn he can start attacking, causing mayhem. Let's see if Kos is going to play out of land. Does have that City of Brass in hand there, a Mox Jet, I believe, as well. A Disenchant, a Fireball. It's hard for me to identify the other two cards. Three cards in hand for Rasmus. And Kos being really in the tank here. Remember, this is the deciding game. Game number three. Taking a damage from his own city, dropping to 20. Well, dropping his back to 20, I should say. Killing the scavenger folk. He really wants to keep his ivory tower. But of course, the problem here is, the problem with ivory tower is, to keep the ivory tower, you got to play a card out of your hand, and your ivory tower is not that good or efficient anymore. I guess there's an attack, by the way. And a whirling dervish coming from the sideboard of Rasmus. So Kos here dropping to 18 after that attack and the pass turn. So five cards in hand for Kos and look at this, there's the Abyss. Drop to 17, playing the Abyss. And of course the Abyss has no effect on Whirling Dervish. But it does mean he's gonna lose a lot of other creatures though. There's the attack of the Dervish. And the Dervish is a card from Legends, protection from black. And it gets a plus one, plus one counter every time it damages the opponent. There's an Elves of the Deep Shadow as well, so even more pressure here. There is a Maze of If. This Maze is really good because it can send back the Whirling Dervish. Rasmus having to sack another creature, is sacking the Elves of the Deep Shadow. Three cards in hand for him. Looks like he's going to attack here or not. Does he want to use the Scavenger Folk? Yeah, he's going to attack. This makes sense because now oh, we see a Disenchant though. I wanted to say, if Kos would have animated the factory, Rasmus could have used the Scavenger Folk to destroy it. But there we saw that Disenchant by Kos. And Kos, of course, sending back the Whirling Dervish. There's a pass. So this is perfect for Kos again with the Abyss. Kind of controlling the board, and I believe he's got another Abyss in hand. He's going to lose the Lanora Elves here to the Abyss. There's a Concordant Crossroads. Is it going to stick? It's going to stick, finally. Remember that game two where Rasmus just couldn't get the Crossroads to stick. The bad news here, of course, for him is that there is another Abyss exactly in the hand here of Ghost. He's playing it out right now. And because of the Enchant World rule, there can only be one Enchant World in play. The cool thing is that the lore of the Enchant World is that it takes you to another world where this effect takes place. There is a Brain Geyser, Power Sink in hand. What's the other card? Can't identify another counter spell. This is really what the, uh, the deck player wants to do, right? Kind of kill the game with control and then slowly build out on that control. There is the crumble. Is he going to counter this? No, he's not. He's like, I'm on 15. It's good. He's going to gain a life here from the crumble as well. He's going to go up to 16. There's another forest and a pass by Rasmus. Four cards in hand. There's an underground sea and a pass. Both players just kind of passing, not doing too much. There's a black lotus here by... Goes in the pass. It's difficult for Rasmus here. He's got to find that other Concorn Crossroads and hope that it doesn't get countered away. 
And I wonder at what time Kos is going to start attacking with his own factories. There's another whirling dervish. That's actually quite nice. But there's a power sink, though, on the dervish. And that's, of course, the problem. If, if, if kind of your pressure stops as the green-black player, you're doing exactly what the deck wants because you're giving the deck time, right, to kind of draw into all those cards. Maybe find a Jam de Tome, play a Brain Geyser Recall, you know, get some card advantage going. And there we see the first attacks being done here by Kos attacking here with the two factories. And I guess he's going to play the Brain Geyser now. Going to play a Brain Geyser, it seems, for four. Going to draw four cards here. One, two, three, four. Going to go up to seven in hand, I believe, passing the turn. This is looking so good for Kos. There's a Bayou. I mean, this is really a game where we can see Kos having kind of full control in, what, turn two? He really... He's really not giving Rasmus a chance here. There's another factory. And it looks like he's going to animate here. The two factories going to attack for four. He's got that other factory open to pump. We're going to see a crumble here. He's going to untap that one to pump the other. So it's a 3-3. Three, three. Going to deal three damage. He could pump it with the other factory. Deal four points of damage. Looks like he's not going to do that, though. I'm a little bit surprised. Because he's got enough mana. He could have tapped the other factory to pump it to four. For some reason, chooses not to. Or maybe it was just an oversight. Anyway, it doesn't matter that much. He's got full control. That's the most important thing. Now he's also found a mind twist. He's probably going to twist here. Yuck, yuck, yuck. There's the twist. <laughs> oh, this is brutal. This is so brutal. A tsunami from the sideboard. That is pretty cool. I would have loved to see a tsunami resolve in the finals. I mean, I remember playing with my uh, mono blue deck Timmy Spellbook and having a, a pirate ship. And my opponent played a tsunami and my pirate ship sank. That was, a, that was a low for me. But it was a really cool move, you know. I do love the art of tsunami as well. Anyway, oh, here's a tranquility. But a counterspell, though. Yeah, I mean, Rasmus is really trying... But it's so tough when you're fighting against all that card advantage. And Kos has that recall. That's probably why he's going for his graveyard thinking, do I want to cast that recall now? Do I want to do that later? I think there's no, there's no real need to do it now. One of the options here for Kos could be to play the Chaos Orb and, you know, flip on the Whirling Dervish. But then again, why would he? I mean, but then you know, Rasmus on nine, you know, he could he could flip on a dervish, attack for four. He's just attacking though for two. He's gonna block one, he's gonna take that out of combat, use it to pump the other, deal three points of damage. Rasmus on six. Kos is so controlled. He's not gonna flip on the dervish. He wants to keep full control. He doesn't mind playing another extra turn, but it's looking really good for Kos. Gonna attack again. Probably going to do the same trick here. No, he's going to trade. I'm a little bit surprised. Going to drop to four. Looks like he wanted to play a recall, but changed his mind. He's so close to the victory now. I'm expecting him here to maybe just get back a counter spell for like full control. Because I don't think he's got a counter spell in hand. It's hard to see. I see his swords, a disenchant, the recoil, and the other two cards are hard to identify. Looks like an artifact there. Is he going to pass the turn here or not? He's going to go for the graveyard again. You've got to understand that, you know, these players have played the whole day and now Kos is so close to winning the tournament. It makes sense that he's really taking his time. So he is going to recall for three here. Oh, for two. Okay, he's going to get back a counterspell, what I expected, and a fireball. And then next turn, he can take the victory with the fireball. I forgot that the fireball was still there in the graveyard. 
One card in hand for Rasmus. I don't think there's a single card in his deck that can save him. Passing the turn here to Kos. Is Kos gonna win it here? Often Troll Cup, number four. Tapping. There's a Giant Grove. He's winning it. Winning Often Troll Cup, number four. Congratulations to Kos and of course also to Rasmus for the being the runner-up for making it all the way to the finals. But in the finals, Kos takes the crown. He takes the Often Troll Cup home. And uh, wow, wow, what a what a final. I mean, that game one, the game two, crazy, 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 crazy. And, you know, both players, you know, you've done an amazing job. Also, a big shout out to Ron for organizing the tournament of the Often Troll Cup. It's every year in Leovarde. If you want to join, check out the uh, the contact info in the description below and you can, uh, you can contact Ron for information, but uh, this was a great, great tournament. Also, a special thanks to Dion for recording uh, all these matches and for helping me out with the live stream. Dion, you are absolutely awesome. Again, congratulations to Coast for winning. This is the winning deck, the deck, and the uber control version of the deck. I mean, and I, Coast is so good with this deck. And also, let's take another moment uh, to look at the deck here of Rasmus. Absolutely beautiful. Well done, Rasmus, for making it all the way to the finals with this underpowered list. You were really the sensation of the day. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for watching the episodes here with me on Timmy Talks. If you're not a subscriber yet, please click that uh, or hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for supporting the channel. Please take a moment to like, uh, comment, and share on this video. All these things are free and they really help the channel move forward. And please consider becoming a Patreon to support me as a content creator. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks and uh, you can read all about my Patreon program. It already starts for $1 a month, so that's not that much. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this tournament as much as I did. I also played in this tournament. It was just a lot of fun. If you missed any of the matches, I'll put a link at the top in the comment section to the playlist of the Often Troll Cup 4. And you can just check out all the, the matches again. I've got matches from the first round in the Swiss all the way up to, to this match, the finals of the tournament. So if you've missed a match, check out that playlist for now. Thank you very much for watching. And let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the Zing!